Chapter Four of Two Thousand Miles Below by Charles Willard Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Light in the Crater. Of course it wasn't blood, said Smitty explosively. But try to tell the men that. See how far you get. Devils. That's been their talk since yesterday, when Riley got smeared up. And now that the bailer's gone, we can't prove a thing. Again he was pacing restlessly back and forth in the little board shack that was Rawson's field headquarters. Rawson, seated by the window, was looking at tables of comparative melting points. He glanced up sharply. "'You haven't found it yet?' he questioned. "'A forty-foot baler? Now that's a nice, easy little thing to mislay.' Riley had followed the excited Smitty into the room. He stood silently by the door until he caught Rawson's questioning glance. Forty feet or forty inches,' he said. "'Tis gone. "'Twas there by the derrick last night. "'And this morning?' "'That's fine,' Rawson interrupted with heavy sarcasm. "'I haven't enough down below ground to keep my mind occupied. "'I need a few mysteries up top. "'Now do you really expect me to believe "'that a thing like that baler has been carried off?' This time it was Smitty who interrupted. "'You can just practice believing on that, Dean,' he said. "'When you get so you can believe a forty-foot baler can vanish into thin air, then you'll be ready for what I've got. This is what I came in to tell you. That one truckload of steel grillage beams for the turbine footings, they were put out where we surveyed for the first powerhouse, dumped on the sand.' "'Well?' questioned Rawson, as Smitty paused. His look was daring Smitty to say what he knew was coming. Five tons of steel beams,' said Smitty softly. "'Gone, just like that. Just a hollow in the sand.' The big figure of the Irish foreman was still beside the door. Rawson saw one clumsy hand make the sign of the cross. Then Riley held that hand before him and stared at it in horror. "'Devil's blood,' he whispered, and I dipped my hands in it. "'Saints protect us all.' That will be all of that, Dean Rawson's usually quiet voice was as full of crackling emphasis as if it had been charged with electrical energy. If anyone thinks that I have gone this far just to be scared out by some dirty sabotage? I see it all around. I don't know how they did it, but it's all come since the gold was found. Someone else wants it. They think they can scare off the men, maybe take a pop shot at me, come back here and clean up later on. Pull up gold by the pailful, I suppose. Riley leaped forward and banged his big fist down on the table. Right you are, he shouted, until loitering men in the open street outside stared curiously. Devils they are, but they're the kind of devils we know how to handle. And now I'll tell you something else, sir. I know where they are hiding. There was no work for anyone last night, but I'm used to being up. I couldn't sleep. I was wandering around thinking of nothing at all out of the way, and I thought I saw some shadows, like it might be men, way off on the sand. Then, later, over to the old ghost town, do you mind, I saw a light, a queer green sort of light. Sure, a fool I was calling myself at the time, but now I believe it. Dean Rawson had crossed the room while the man was still speaking. He dragged the wooden case from beneath his cot and smashed at the lid with a wrecking bar. Then he reached inside and drew forth a blue black forty-five. He tossed the pistol to Riley. "'Know how to use one of these?' he asked. The manner in which the big Irishman snapped open the side ejection was sufficient answer. Dean handed another gun to Smitty, then pulled out more and laid them on his cot, together with a little pile of cartridge boxes. "'You're all right, Riley,' he said. "'Just keep your head.' Don't let your damned superstitions run away with you. And I wouldn't ask for a better man to stand alongside of in a scrape. The foreman beamed with pleasure. Rawson went on in crisp sentences. Take these guns. Take plenty of ammunition. Pick five or six men you know you can depend on. Mount guard around the camp tonight. I'll post an order saying you're in charge. And I'm telling you now to use those guns on anything you see. "'Smitty,' he said to the other man who had been quietly listening, "'you and I are going to start for town. "'Only Riley will know that we're gone for the night. "'We'll have a little listening post of our own up here in the hills.' 
but Rawson postponed their going. More material was arriving. One casting in particular needed all the men and Rawson's supervision to place it on the sand, where an erection crew could swing it into place at some later date. And then, when he and Smitty had driven away from camp with the distant city as their announced destination, Rawson still did not go directly to the mountain grade. He swung off instead where rolling sand hills blocked all view from the camp and headed the car into a gusty wind that brought whirling clouds of dust. They almost obscured the crumbling walls at the volcano's base. The ghost towns that are found here and there in the forsaken wilderness of the West are depressing to anyone who walks their empty streets. Little Rhyolite was no exception. In gray, ghostly walls, empty windows stared steadily, disconcertingly, like sockets of dead eyes in tattered, weather-beaten skulls. Dean and Smitty walked among the roofless ruins. Lizards, the color of the cold gray walls, slipped from sight on silent, clinging feet. Once a sidewinder, almost invisible against the sand, looped away from the intruders with smooth deliberation. "'No marks here,' said Rawson at last. Even an Indian can't read sign in this ashy sand when the wind has dusted it off. He turned his head from a whirl of fine ash where the wind, sweeping around a wall of stone, was scouring at a sand dune's sloping side. Dean, said Smitty, old Riley may have been looking for banshees when he saw these lights. Superstitious old cuss. Riley, maybe there wasn't anything here. But, Dean, there's some confoundedly funny things happening around here. Are you telling me? Rawson asked grimly. But we want to remember one thing, he added. We've punched a hole in the ground, and we've got into a place that is hot enough to melt Krieger alloy one minute and is stone cold the next. That's disturbing enough. But we don't want to get that mixed up with what's happening up top. There's dirty work going on. He stopped. His eyes, that had never ceased to search for some mark of special meaning, had come to rest upon an object half hidden in the sand. He stooped and picked it up. "'Now what the devil is this?' Smitty began. But Rawson was staring at the smooth lava block that was in his hand. It was tapered. It was pierced through with a straight, smooth hole, and its base was round and ringed as if it had been held in a clamp." That, he said at last, was brought in from the outside. Outside, Smitty. Get that? Dean Rawson's face was wreathed in a sudden smile of pure pleasure. No, I don't know what the darn thing is, he admitted, and I don't care. But I know that someone, or some bunch of someones, outsiders, are trying to horn in. I might even go so far as to say that I suspect the power monopoly, gentlemen. I think they have started in on us, plan to run off our men, interfere in every way, and drive me out of the field with the boring of failure. Smitty, I begin to think I'm going to enjoy this job. Again the hot wind, only beginning to cool with the setting of the sun, swept around the building where they stood and tore at the hill of sand. Come on, said Rawson. It's getting dark. We'll get up to our lookout. Hold on, called Smitty sharply. Rawson turned. Smitty was rubbing his eyes when the whirl of wind-borne sand had passed, he was staring at the sand dunes. "'I'm seeing things, I guess,' he said. "'I thought for a minute there was a hole there, and the sand was slipping. "'I'm getting as bad as Riley.' The two went back through the gathering shadows to their waiting car, and Smitty's involuntary shiver told Rawson that he was not the only one to feel a sense of relief at the sound of the exhaust as their car took them away from the dead bones of a dead city in a barren, trackless waste. The shoulder of rock, where the mountain road swung out, gave a comprehensive view of camp and desert and the encircling mountains. Above, in a vault of black, was the dazzling array of stars as the desert lands know them. So low they were. The ragged, broken tops of the three ancient craters seemed touching the warm velvet of the sky on which the stars were hung. Beyond their smooth slopes, a spreading glow gave promise of the rising moon. Rawson headed the car down grade, in readiness for a quick return. He ran it close to the inner wall of rock, out of which the road had been carved, 
then seated himself on the outer rim without thought of the thousand-foot sheer drop beneath his dangling legs. With a glass he was sweeping the foreground, where the scattered lights of the camp were like vagrant reflections of the stars thrown back to them from the dead sea of sand. "'Riley's on the job,' he told Smitty, when he passed over the glass later on, "'and I've got my pocket portable.' He took the little radio receiver from his pocket as he spoke. Riley will signal me from my office if he sees anything. The moon had cleared the mountains. Its flood of light poured across their rugged heights and filled the bowl of the Tana Basin as some master of great theatrical switchboard might have flooded a dark stage with magic illumination, half-concealing, transforming whatever things it touched. All the hard brilliance of sunlit sands was gone. The rolling dunes were softly mellow, the more distant mountains were dream peaks, half real, they seemed, and half imagined in a veil of haze. Even the buildings, the scattered piles of material, the gaunt skeleton of the derrick, their stark blackness of outline and clear-cut shadows were gone. The whole land was drenched in the mystery and magic of a desert moon. Rawson and the man beside him were silent. Even a mind perplexed by unanswerable problems must pause before the witchery of nature's softer moods. "'If Riley were here,' said Smitty softly at last, "'he wouldn't be seeing any devils. Fairies, pixies, the little people, he'd be seeing them dancing.' Rawson shot his companion a sidelong, appraising glance. He had never penetrated before to the substratum of Smitty's nature. He had never, in fact, felt that he knew much about Smitty, whose past was still the one topic that was never mentioned. He saw his thick mop of black hair and the profile of his face as Smitty stared fixedly down towards the sleeping camp. It was a matter of minutes or so before he knew that the head was outlined against an aura of red light. Smitty was seated at his right. Off beyond him, the three extinct craters made a dark background, where the moonlight had not yet reached to the inner slopes. Smitty's head was directly in line with the largest crater's irregularly broken top, and about it was the faintest tinge of red. For a moment the light flamed close. It seemed to be hovering about the head of the silent, seated man. Then Rawson moved, looked past, and found a true perspective for the phenomena. One rugged cleft in the rim of the crater's cup made a peephole for seeing within. It was plainly red. The light came from inside the age-old throat. "'It's alive,' Rawson whispered in quick consternation. Almost he expected to see billowing clouds of smoke, the fearful pyrotechnics of volcanic eruption. He sensed more than saw that Smitty had not turned his head. "'Look!' he was shouting by now. "'Wake up, Smitty! Good Lord!' He stopped, open-mouthed. The red glow had met volcanic fires. To have it change abruptly to a green radiance was disconcerting. Green, pale green. Only through the gap, like a space where a tooth was missing in the giant jaw, could Dean Rawson see the changed light. Only from this one point could the view be had. There would be nothing visible from the camp below. And as quickly as it had come, all thought of volcanic fires left him. He knew with quick certainty that this was something that concerned him, that threatened, and that was linked up with the other threatening, mysterious happenings of the recent nights and days. Still Smitty had not turned. Rawson felt one quick flash of annoyance at his helper's dullness or indifference. Then he knew that Smitty's dark-haired head was reached forward, that he was bending at a precarious angle to stare below him into the valley. Then... "'They're there,' said Smitty, in a hushed voice, as if someone or something on the desert floor far below might hear and take alarm. "'Look, Dean, where's your glass? What are they?' His cautious whispering was unnecessary. Below them a thin line of light pierced the darkness, another, then three more in quick succession, before the sharp crack of pistol fire came to the men a thousand feet above. Rawson had snatched up his binoculars. To the left, Smitty was directing. Off there, by the big casting. Great Scott, what's that light? Rawson got it in his glass. A single flash of green that cut the blackness with an almost audible hiss. 
It was gone in an instant, while the man's voice screamed once in fear and agony, one scream that broke like brittle steel in the same instant that it began. Dean found the big casting in the circle of his glass. There were black figures moving near it. They were indistinct. He changed the focus. They were gone before he could get their images sharp. But the casting? Plainly he saw its great bulk that many men had worked to ease down to the sand. It was outlined clearly now until its edge became a blur, until the sand rolled in upon it and its black mass became a circle that shrank and shrank and vanished utterly at the last. "'It's gone!' Ransom shouted. "'It sank into the sand. I saw it!' He was running for the car. A clamor of voices was coming from below. The sound died under the thunder of the car's exhaust as Rawson gave it the gun and sent the big machine leaping toward the waiting curves. End of chapter 4